Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, a celebration of South Africa's biodiversity, part one, presented by NatHab expedition leader, Lorraine Doyle. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Lorraine. Hi, right, thank you so much. Uh, Rob, um, it's great. It's great to be here, and um, yeah, I have people listening in over the festive season, um, and that was also why I, when I was thinking about a topic um, for today, I thought that looking at um, a celebration of um, South Africa's biodiversity somehow seemed um, appropriate or apt. Um, I think. One of the things is that so often we talk about, and I'll get into this just now in terms of what I mean by biodiversity, but one of the things that often happens is we talk about um, how we're losing biodiversity. And while that is true, I just sometimes think we don't sometimes take a step back um, and look at what it is that we have um, and celebrate that because it is so truly remarkable. So. Um, I'm very privileged um, to live in South Africa. Um, I'm privileged to have been born on the African continent. I was born in Zimbabwe. Um, and so, yeah, this um, is a, something that is uh, really, really close to to my to my heart. So on the little um, stylized map in front of you, um, you have, you've got um, the South African flag, um, our national um, antelope, which is the springbok, our national bird, which is the blue crane, and also our national um, flower, which is a king protea. So let's get started. So as Rob said, unfortunately, I don't, um, I'm based out um, on a reserve, and so we tend to have um, what we call bush Wi-Fi. So I don't have the greatest of bandwidths. Um, and so the minute I turn on my webcam, um, it tends to cause chaos. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, um, this photograph was taken actually on safari this year with NATAB. Um, this was taken at um, a decoy safari lodge, which is one of the places we go to. Um, and these are just some of the amazing staff um, that work there. Um, so yeah, very privileged to have them as colleagues. So I think the first thing to ask ourselves is the question, um, what is biodiversity? Uh, and I think for any of you who read um, any sort of nature-based um, literature, you know, whether it's popular science um, or even programs that you might watch on television, biodiversity has become something of a buzzword. Um, and it's one of those words which actually has quite a lot more to it than perhaps meets the eye. Um, but this is a very simple um, definition of it. So it's a shortened version of biological. Um, so that's where the bio comes from. Um, and then obviously diversity. And really what it's looking at is the variety and variability of life on Earth. So that's very broad brushstrokes. Um, and what we'll be looking at today is um, is much um, much more detailed or on a much smaller scale than that. Um, so looking at some of the um, ecosystems, if you will, within South Africa and how diverse those are. Um, but yes, you can look at it on um, both a macro and a micro and, um, and a micro scale. It also includes the diversity within and between species and among the different ecosystems they form. Um, and so there are, um, and I won't get into this too much, but in ecological terms, um, we talk about alpha diversity, beta diversity, gamma diversity, and each of these is looking at different elements of um, how things vary within an ecosystem. Um, so it, looking at alpha diversity, for example, looking at variation between um, species um, within 
a landscape um, and then going on to bigger landscapes. Um, and so we can essentially spread this out. Um, but so all we're really looking at here is, um, and I think it's um, stylized quite nicely in this little um, diagram, um, you get a concept that it's it's everything from the bugs to the snakes to the sharks um, to the wolves. Um, and in this case, I mean, they've also included um, domesticated livestock. Um, so yes, it's this whole um, incredible mix um, that of living things that we experience. So um, I'm not going to bombard you with too many figures, um, but I thought this was quite a nice stylized um, graphic. Just looking at, so this is looking at global biodiversity. Um, and um, it comes from a website, which I put at the bottom there, um, which is actually a very interesting website to, um, to go to. And what it does is it's listed the top um, 19 um, biodiverse uh, countries on the planet. Um, and then what it's done is it's worked out a biodiversity index. Um, the algorithms that they use to denote or to calculate these this diversity index is, is pretty um, complex. But it does allow a, us to have certain levels of comparison. Um, for example, if we look at Brazil, which is with the Amazon considered the most diverse um, country on Earth, it's got a global biodiversity index of um, 512. Um, and then you go down to South Africa, um, which is extremely diverse still, but with a biodiversity index of, um, you know, basically half of that. Um, and some of these, if you have a look, um, there's some interesting kind of, or perhaps some unusual ones in there, places like Myanmar, um, Malaysia. Um, so we tend to think of the more tropical areas. Um, as being um, perhaps more biodiverse, but there are certainly places on here, like Myanmar, for example, um, which are certainly, um, you know, not, not tropical. So this is just to give you an idea of looking at numbers of birds, species, amphibians, fish, mammals, reptiles, um, and vascular plants. So this is how um, when we talk about biodiversity, these are the kinds of um, elements that we are looking at um, when we talk about um, having a biodiverse um, environment. So just before I go on to South Africa's biodiversity, why is biodiversity important? Why are we interested in it? And essentially we're interested in it from a scientific perspective because Biodiversity um, gives a resilience um, to an ecosystem. So the more component parts that you have um, of any given system, the more likely it is to be able to stand up um, to challenges that it may, the environment they may encounter, be that drought, be it flood. Um, so the more biodiverse an area is, the more likely it is um, to have a higher resilience. So South Africa, um, as we saw from the slide just now, is one of the 20 most biodiverse countries in the world. Interestingly, when you go through a lot of these, um, if you go to different websites, you'll get um, really quite um, large discrepancies in whether it's you know 19th or whether it's fifth or so again, it's just a little bit of, um, and that is why a biodiversity index score um, is really important uh, because that just gives a little bit more of a scientific basis um, to it. So the other thing about South Africa, it's the only country in the world to contain an entire floral kingdom. Um, so there are numerous floral kingdoms, um, but we are privileged to have um, an entire floral kingdom, um, which is the Cape Floral Kingdom. 
um, and it's home to over 9,000 different plant species, um, which is quite, quite extraordinary. And then although South Africa occupies only 2% of the world's land area, um, it's home to 10% of the world's plant species um, and 7% of the world's reptile, bird and mammal species. So we really are um, extremely privileged um, and certainly when we take guests on safari, um, you know, we have uh, an abundance of um, variety to, to share with people. So I just wanted to, um, on this specific presentation, just look really briefly at four um, of the ecosystems that we have within our country, just to give you an idea of um, how diverse South Africa is. Um, I think very often when people think about coming to Africa, they think about safari, um, and that leads them automatically to think about savannas because that's typically where um, we would have the sorts of animals that people want to come and see. Um, but as you can see from, um, from these four pictures, um, there are extremely varying um, environments that exist within, um, with, that exist within South Africa. Um, and obviously the reason why we have these landscapes, this is what allows us to have the levels of diversity um, that we do have. So just a quick look, sorry, it's not the clearest map, um, but so in the bottom sort of west um, and stretching a short way along the east coast, um, we have the Feinbos, um biome, so that's part of the Cape Floral Kingdom. Um, then above that, we have the succulent Karoo, which stretches all the way up to the border with Namibia. Um, then um, we'll look at, I'll only sort of point out today the ones that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail. Um, then we've got a large area of um, that light green, which goes all over Lesotho, right up a little bit of Swaziland, um, and then all the way down to the eastern part of the Eastern Cape um, as um, grassland. Um, and then by far the largest um, area or biome is the savanna biome. Um, and then there are a few other smaller ones, which um, I will look at as part of another presentation um, in which I'll also look at some of our neighboring countries, um, countries like Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana. So Feinbos, um literally translates to fine bush um, and the actual origin of the name is um, kind of a little bit one of those that's lost in the mists of time um, but it's possible that many of the component parts of Feinbos um, have got fine leaves um, and perhaps that's where the name um, came from. So the Cape Floral Kingdom um, contains Feinbos, but it also contains other forms um, which of plant life, which we're not really going to examine um, here, because I think the Feinbos is probably the most characteristic um, of um, the Western the Western Cape, and certainly the pe that which people would see if they kind of went um, down to Cape Town, for example. So um, it's actually characterized um, by the presence of something called restios. Um, so I'll show you the, the component parts now. Um, but typically, feinbos, as opposed to things called strontfelt um, and other forms of um, within the Cape Floral Kingdom, the presence of restios um, is the kind of determining factor for feinbos. So the other component part of Feinbos um, are proteoids. Um, so some protea species and then other species like this one, which is a pincushion. Um, and these beautiful um, flowers have an interesting relationship with um, an ant. It's called a pugnacious ant. Um, and what these seeds do or these flowers do is they produce 
um, a jelly-like substance around their seeds, which ants, um, these ants love. And so what will happen is these ants will carry the seeds away, um, take them down into their, um, you know, into their little um, ant burrows, consume the jelly-like substance, um, which is highly um, nutritious, and then they discard the seed underground. So now this whole seed has found a way to be taken from an outside environment, um, basically down into a nice, humid, dark, moist place where it can germinate. Um, and this, um, this sort of practice by ants is known as uh, murmur mimicry. And it's, it's not an uncommon um, relationship, um, but it's definitely one that exists um, in the Feinbos amongst um, these pincushions or to give them their scientific name, um, Lucas Bermans. So these are um, perhaps the most recognizable um, for anybody who thinks about um, the Cape Floral Kingdom. Um, proteas. Um, so the one on the um, left-hand side of the screen is a cape, um, a, a um, giant, uh, or oh, sorry, a king protea. Um, and proteas are a key part, um, together with things like your leucospermums. Um, these are a big part of the whole um, Cape Floral Kingdom and indeed the Fainbos. So when we have uh, plants like these, which are really quite unique um, to this part of the country, um, we have some very special birds and this is a Cape sugar bird. Um, and so this is in, an endemic bird to the region. Um, and basically by endemic, we mean it occurs here um, and nowhere else on earth. Um, so highly specialized and the king protea um, actually forms a large part of its diet um, so obviously um, a very strong relationship there between um, the cape sugarbird and the the king protea so other types of proteas that grow in um, the environment are low um, to the ground ones that look like this um, this is known as a I don't know its common name, but it's Protea aculoas. And what's interesting about these is they are pollinated by a mouse. Um, it's a striped mouse, um, genus Rhabdomus. And instead of producing extremely showy flowers or lots of rich nectar, um, they have a very, very strong and distinctive odor. And as a result of that, the mouse is attracted to the odor, um, will come, will have some of the nectar because there is production of nectar, but it's not the main attraction. Um, and then as they forage, um, you can actually see on this photograph, you can see the little anthers um, with pollen on them. So the mouse, as it's foraging around, gets covered in um, pollen and so takes it onto the next plant. So you can see that within the system like this, um, you have a whole variety of different creatures, which essentially are really important to making this whole ecosystem function. Um, so this is another key part of Feinbos, um, known as these are what we call ericoids. Um, and this is um, quite aptly named, its common name is a beautiful, beautiful erica. Um, there's about 760 species um, worldwide, mainly growing in countries with what we would call a Mediterranean climate, which is very similar to that in the Cape. Um, and the Cape Floral Kingdom contains 526 of those 760 species, um, which is truly remarkable. Um, to give you a comparison, uh, the whole of Europe has only 14 species. Um, so. Yeah, um, quite quite incredible. So here you've got you've got proteas as part of this ecosystem. You've got these ericoids, um, 
And then the one that I mentioned right in the beginning, saying this is really what characterizes Feinbos itself, um, are these um, rather perhaps in many ways unremarkable looking plants, um, which are known as restios. Um, and there's approximately 330 different species in the Cape. Um, and what is so um, good about them um, is that they are so well adapted to their environment. So they are capable of growing in waterlogged um, situations when there's heavy rainfall, but they can also withstand incredible baking heat um, and dryness. Um, and so together with the proteas and the ericas, these make up um, that diverse system, um, which um, supports, you know, um, a remarkable, um, a remarkable amount of, of variety. So I'm not going to delve um, very deep, no pun intended, um, into the marine element, but I just wanted to mention it because um, I think it is something that in terms, again, of South Africa, we are really blessed with. Um, we have um, approximately 10% of the world's coral species um, and also a large number of octopus, squid, um, cuttlefish. So we have a very rich um, marine diversity as well. Um, and so uh, people visiting South Africa have the ability to, to see not only necessarily the big five, um, but also some of these other environments um, without having to cross out of the country's borders. So the grassland, um, so this is a picture of um, uh, an area of grassland in what we call the high felt. Um, so when we talk about felt, we are talking about really land or, um, yeah, it's an Afrikaans word really for land. And as you can see here, um, apart from in the, there's a, a gully or a valley, there's some trees, but for the most part, the rest of this environment is um, totally without large trees. Um, and it's sitting incredible, generally, this is sitting um, at higher elevations um, and it's dominated, as its name suggests, it's dominated by grasses. However, not only does it have a large amount of grasses, um, but it also has um, the most incredible diversity of what we call um, geophytes um, or bulbs, if you will. Um, and these are just two um, of many, many, many species. Um, so the pink one are known as harebells. Um, and then the orange one is um, a Watsonia. It doesn't have, Watsonias don't have a common name. Um, and then this one is a freesia. And for any of you who are gardeners, you will know that some of these names probably seem familiar to you. Um, and that's because many of the bulbs that are um, grown um, now around the world, um, a lot of those, um, they were certainly um, had origins within South Africa um, and are endemic um, to, to the grassland. So if we think about the grassland, yes, we do have large animals as part of that. Grazers, obviously, because there are no trees to browse. But there's also a very rich assemblage of smaller creatures. Um, and this um, little chap here is a sun gazer um, lizard, whose scientific name is small, Smog Giganteus. Um, I love the fact that it's called Smog. Um, is endemic to the high felt grasslands. Um, and in fact, um, the entire species or distribution, if you will, of this species falls within the high felt grassland. Um, so it ha it is um, an incredibly specialized animal. It gets its name sun gazer. It's showing a typical pose here with its head up, apparently looking like it's gazing at the sun. Um, 
And whilst I said I didn't want to dwell on any of the sort of negative stuff, um, it is um, it is endangered because of the pet trade, um, and also because it has such a specialised habitat. Um, it also does um, suffer some threat from agricultural practices that happen um, in these grasslands. Um, but there has been a lot of research done. Um, a friend of mine supervised um, the PhD that was done on this. Um, the photograph actually was taken by the chap who did the PhD, Siobhan. And um, so we're trying to better understand them. Um, but yeah, they really are a very, very special species that is part of this um, unique um, environment. And then we get generalists. Um, so like in all things, there are specialists and then there are generalists. So this is a helmeted guinea fowl, um, or as a friend of mine's little boy used to call them guinea flowers. And I just included this because anyone who's been on safari um, will probably have seen guinea fowl. So they are capable of living in a wide variety of different habitats, from grassland to low felt savanna to more arid savanna. Um, and so um, they, because they are more generalist, um, they are just able to um, survive in a, a far greater um, amount of, of different areas um, than something like the sun gazer lizard. Um, and then we get another sort of high felt specialist. Um, this little antelope is a mountain reed buck. Um, and as you can see there, it's um, very much in a very grassy environment. Um, so males have got horns, females um, don't have um, don't have any horns. But these are um, a species that you will only really find in the grasslands. Um, and there's others, similar ones like the Oribi. Um, those are completely unique to to the grasslands. Um, so another another idea of of generalists and specialists. So the next one um, is the most typical, if you will, of the safari destinations. This photograph was actually taken at Mala Mala, um, which is one of the places we go to on secluded South Africa. Um, and as you can see, a very different um, landscape um, to the grassland um, that we looked at just now. Um, these rocky outcrops, um, big trees um, interspersed with grass. And I thought just for the purposes of showing biodiversity, um, I'll, I would stay away from the typical um, big five, um, if you will, you know, that are so typical of um, the savannah environment. Um, so this bird is a purple crested taraco. Um, and the reason for including it is that the taracos are unique um, in that they are the only birds to have a um, specific green pigmentation. Um, so it's called um, Taraco verdin. And they are the only birds in the world that have this green pigmentation to the whole group of Tarakos. Other birds, um, essentially, they have a combination of yellowish pigments like um, carotene, and then you have optical blue effects, um, which give you the green. So that's where you would get your Tyndall scattering of light, um, so structural coloration, um, which would give you your greenish hues. Um, whereas this is just pigment. Um, they also have um, this red pigment, um, chirison, um, which um, again is different to other birds where red um, is generally due to carotenoids. Um, so quite a specialist um, group. This bird is absolutely beautiful when it flies. Um, I've yet to catch one in flight um, because the underwing is bright scarlet red. Um, they really are spectacular birds. So when we think of carnivores, um, I think we all think of lions, leopards and cheetahs. Um, so this is one of South Africa's smallest carnivores. Um, these are dwarf mongoose. Um, and I just included this specific picture because you can see that although they really are quite cute and cuddly, um, have a look at those teeth. 
Um, you can see that they have pretty ferocious teeth on them um, and they will consume, um, they can consume small rodents, um, snakes, um, insects, millipedes, a whole variety of different things. Um, but along with birds, reptiles, um, insects and mammals, we need this entire diversity um, to make up this um, savanna um, ecosystem. So thought as well I'd focus some attention on some of our really beautiful plants. Um, and this is known as a kudu lily, um, flowers in the winter. Um, looks a little bit like a miniature baobab for anyone who's ever seen a baobab. Um, it's actually highly toxic. Um, so in com combination with um, other roots and bulbs, um, it has historically been used as a fish poison. Um, but a really um, stunning flower um, to see um, in the in the winter months when everything is quite dry. I know most people are a little um, averse um, to to snakes, but um, this is a particularly beautiful one, and I just think it's got this amazing red tongue with a black tip. Um, it's known as a vine snake, um, sometimes also called a twig or a bird snake. Um, it is it is highly venomous, um, but it is a very shy and retiring snake, um, and so the chances of being bitten by one are extremely extremely small. Um, but it has the ability to basically keep completely still, so much so that it looks actually like it's a branch. Um, and that's how it will wait for something to come along um, for it to then consume. So hence the name um, twig snake. A slightly bigger animal. So these are water buck. Um, as their name suggests, quite water dependent. Um, have this beautiful shaggy coat, which has a water repellent secretion on it. Um, that allows them to repel water. Um, so living in this environment, you know, with um, the other um, creatures that we've seen in the last few slides. And then another unusual one um, that's one of my favorites. Um, so this is an African moon moth, um, so also sometimes call it an African lunar moth. And um, this is a male. Um, and the reason I can tell that is by those beautiful fluffy plumos, we call them antennae, which are used to detect pheromones. Um, so uh, this looks like when it's kind of in a, this was perched on a, on a grass stalk, but when it's in a more natural um, area, uh, it actually has the ability to look a lot like a leaf. Um, particularly with sort of trailing edges that look a little bit withered and dried out. Um, and that's really its only form of um, camouflage. Um, the eye spots, um, we think that all of these creatures which have eye spots like this, um, it's potentially to um, deter predators um, because that looks like quite a, if you look at the gap between the eye spots, um, it's quite a big gap. And so as a result, um, it potentially looks like, you know, that there's um, a rather large, a larger creature than there, than there really is. Um, so, yeah, beautiful African moon moth. And then um, I just included this picture just, as I said, with the celebrating biodiversity of these hippos. And uh, this was just a really um, lovely moment where the one little hippo said, roll over and um, out with his cute four little hippo toes. Um, so just a reminder about hippos, considered the mixed up animal, um, lives in water but can't swim, um, doesn't eat um, fish or really any, even doesn't eat much aquatic vegetation that comes out to graze. Um, so really also quite a unique animal, um, but definitely um, one of the uh, one of the favorites. And then just to prove that pigeons can be beautiful, um, this is an African green pigeon um, and it's one of my favorite birds. Um, it has an amazing call, it sounds like Tarzan. Um, and yeah, for as pigeons go, 
um it's i think it i think it um definitely could be considered one of the really beautiful ones so this is arid savannah um so it's characterized as arid savannah and not desert because it gets um, quite a lot of rainfall or gets more rainfall than it um, would if it were a desert. Um, but just to give you a contrasting landscape, um, you can see flat topped umbrella thorns, trees, um, much drier grass. Um, and it has its own assemblage um, of animals. Um, so this is a bird known as an Amaqua sand grass. Um, and what's incredible about these is this bird taking off as a male. Um, and what the males do is they have specialized breast feathers and they can actually absorb water like a sponge. Um, and they will then fly quite significant distances back to a nest to provide water for chicks um, and the female. Um, so it's a really um, good adaptation um, to living in a dry, arid environment. Um, so yeah, very, very pretty birds as well. So right in the beginning, we had the springbok um, as our national um, animal. And so here, um, this is the typical environment favored by springbok. Um, these dry, open grasslands, see white bellies um, help reflect um, the heat that's being radiated up from the ground. Um, they also use their white tail um, that also reflects um, sun's rays to help keep them cool. Um, so also very well adapted to this environment. Um, small carnivores and big ones. Um, so this is a blackback jackal um, and they are largely omnivorous. Um, so they will eat anything from fruits to insects to small rodents. Um, and then another specialist of this environment, this is a ground squirrel um, feeding on a tuba. And I couldn't find a picture of one that um, I'd taken which had it with its tail over its back, but they actually use their tail as a bit of a parasol. Um, so when it's really hot, they can pop their, um, fluff their tail out, pop it over their back, um, and it allows them to keep, um, they can stay out longer um, foraging um, because they have an inbuilt um, parasol or umbrella. Um, the very majestic um, it's called a Gems book um, in South Africa. Um, other people may know it as um, some sort of oryx um, with these incredible um, sharp rapier-like horns. Um, they have an amazing system um, called a retmorabla, um, essentially in their, um, in their nose, um, it, which essentially works like a radiator. Um, and so warm blood from the heart um, so the brain passes through this network of vehicle, passes through this network of vessels, sorry. Um, and then veins that are carrying blood already cooled through evaporation in the nasal area surround this network. And so you have a heat exchange system going on. Um, and as a result of that, we get lowered um, blood temperature to the brain um, because these animals um, are often in environments of extreme heat um, and without this um, ability they wouldn't um, they wouldn't survive again you can also see lower parts of the belly white um, designed to reflect reflect the heat um, coming up from the um, from the from the stand Another uh, unique bird um, of these arid, dry environments is known as a cori bustard. Um, so it's our largest flying bird, um, and the males have been documented to weigh up to 25 pounds. Um, watching one of these try and fly is a little bit like watching a jumbo jet try and take off. Um, the book says they are reluctant flyers. Um, that's very true. Um, but that's a lot of um, weight to be lifting off the ground. So they'll take a very long run, um, run up um, and then a very sort of slow and, and quite um, quite cumbersome takeoff, if you will. Um, but yeah, very, um, very beautiful birds as well. So 
again, just to show how much um, diversity there can be in any one of these systems um, where you have animals that are generalists. Um, uh, this beautiful, um, quite dark maned um, lion um, was taken. Um, I took this photograph um, last year um, in the Kalahari. So, yeah, just to show that um, not only do they occur in kind of the more moist savannas um, of Africa, but they also can survive in these much drier environments. Um, another specialist bird, and um, this is a secretary bird. Um, and I just included it because it's really quite a unique looking bird. Um, it also has a unique way of um, killing its prey. Um, it stamps on it with its feet. Um, so they will often feed on snakes if they can get them. Um, and they will literally trample them to, to death. Uh, much more elegant flyers than quarry bustards, um, but nonetheless, quite a, quite a significant um, wingspan. Um, and then this little chap, um, another specialist of these more dry areas, this is a bat-eared fox. Um, so those big ears both help with cooling um, and it helps for them to listen to the movement of insects underground um, because they forage on things like termites um, and they can actually hear these insects moving underground because of these um, enormous ears that they have. So. Um, one of the specialists rather than generalists of this arid savanna environment. And then um, the last um, system that I want to sort of um, touch on briefly this, uh, today is the succulent karoo. Um, it's called the succulent karoo because it has more succulent species um, actually than anywhere else on earth. Um, so when we talk about succulents, we're talking about plants with um, very sort of fleshy um, leaves um, and very often will have a bulbous storage um, ability um, in terms of storing water underground. Um, so yeah, they can store water in their roots, their leaves, their stems. And what is so incredibly special about the succulent karoo um, are the daisies of the portion we call the Maquiland. Um, so this is a spectacle that happens in August and September of every year um, for a large stretch um, up the west up the west coast of um, South Africa. And it truly is a sight to behold. And what's incredible as well about this particular system is it it's what we know or call in ecological terms a pioneer environment. Or, um, and normally um, people will say, well, you don't want to have a piece of land in a pioneer state. You want it to have gone through um, to a more climax um, state, which is considered a more stable system. But the situation here is, is that the climate is such that the rainfall only permits for a pioneer species to survive. So larger plants um, don't have the ability to um, endure the conditions that prevail here. And so if we were to get more or a lot less rainfall um, along this section of Namaquiland coast, um, we would lose this incredible show um, of um, Namaquiland I say daisies, daisies are part of the mix, um, but there are also many, many other species um, that come into this um, incredible abundance of color and diversity. Um, again, another um, photo of just this um, sea of color um, that um, carpets, carpets the landscape. You'll see there um, old fashioned um, windmills. So these are driving, um, pumps uh, which are pumping up water because this is a naturally very arid um, environment. In fact, much of the water that comes in is actually coming in as mist um, or fog off the ocean. Um, and so in terms of if there are livestock farmers um, and so on in these areas, um, then tapping into groundwater um, is a very crucial part of, um, 
of maintaining that um, that ability to farm. And then you also have a variety of these other succulent plants. Um, and this is just one of many, 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 many hundreds um, of these types of plants. Um, they don't really have a common a common name, and these are called conophytes. They're called conophytums. Um, and so, as you can see, um, these ones are flowering, but for the most part, they consist of this um, stem, if you will, uh, which has no obvious leaves, um, just this very um, bulbous, succulent um, stem. Um, and that is where all the moisture um, is contained. And so these plants can exist in very small rocky outcrops um, and with basically very, very little surface water available. Um, so they store what they can um, and utilize that to survive through dry periods. Um, there's other um, plants that occur here um, known as window plants. Um, that basically really have um, no proper leaves. They just, um, they have almost what looks like a little window onto the stem, which is underground. And that is what allows for photosynthesis to take place. So um, another amazing adaptation um, to an environment. So that brings me to the end of um, the talk this evening and I hope that I've just managed to share a little bit um, of the incredible diversity um, that we are privileged to have um, within South Africa um, and yeah I'm happy to answer um, any questions thanks Rob all right thank you Lorraine now before we start in with the question and answer session I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's grab some of these questions. So are the birds in South Africa similar to the birds found in Botswana? Yes, um, we do share, we do share um, quite a lot of species, um, but we will have um, endemics um, just like they will have endemics. So, for example, things like the Cape sugarbird that I mentioned, um, that will occur only in South Africa. You won't find it in um, Botswana. Um, but there are birds um, like purple-crested taraco, um, African green pigeon. Many of those species will also be shared in common with um, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, um, and further afield. Um, so, yes, there are specialists, but there are also ones that will occur, um, you know, further um, up into Africa. So since daisies bloom in August and September, is that a good time to view snakes? Sorry, say that again. Is it a good time to view snakes in August and September when the daisies bloom? Um. No, not really in that environment. Um, so, um, I mean, you obviously do get snakes in that environment, but um, it's it's quite a dry, arid landscape. Um, and so there's not a large variety um, of snakes in that environment. Actually, what you're more likely to see are um, some of the tortoises. So there's a number of tortoise species that we have, which you can find in those areas. Um, but not really snakes per se. Well, well speaking of snakes, uh, you showed us a vine snake hiding in a shrub or a plant. Can you tell us what those, what that plant was, what those leaves were that the snake was hiding behind? Um, can I go back to the slide? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just have a quick look. I can't remember what it's. I think it's a Cape honeysuckle. So, oh no, <laughs> um, it's an acacia. Um, so it's one of our thorn trees. I'm just having a look. Mm, 
think it may well be something like a um, a black monkey thorn um, because I can just see two curved thorns up at the top. Um, so yeah, it's one of our acacia species. Great. Thank you for answering that. We appreciate that. So is it allowed to hunt and own a springbok uh, in its skin, like a deer skin? Um, yes. Um, I mean, so at one point within the Karoo, um, which is part of, we, we, we touched a little bit on the um, succulent Karoo, but part of another ecosystem, the Nama Karoo, there were reports um, of a time gone by where the springbok herd would take days to go past a set point. There were so many tens of thousands of them. And one of the challenges that um, we have now as a result of those times is um, they were kind of hunted without impunity um, over that period of time. So the population was substantially reduced. Um, but yes, there are still places where um, hunting is permitted um, and where, um, yes, you would more than likely be able to um, own the skin. So, um, yeah, it would be, I'm pretty sure it would be possible, yes. Great, thanks. So, um, excuse me, is there any danger of running out of groundwater if it continues to be pumped up? Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it's one of the one of the big challenges um, of any arid environment. Um, and Africa is an arid continent um, that one has to be extremely careful about how many aquifers um, are being tapped into, how much water is being extracted um, over any given time. Um, and unfortunately, it does happen that some of these wells run dry. Um, and that is because of, you know, decades of um, of utilization. So it's it's definitely one of the challenges. Um, you know, people are like, well, if there's a water problem, I'll just sink a borehole. Um, but again, it's it's a finite resource. Um, and so technically, um, from an ecological perspective, um, all of these things should be monitored incredibly closely. Is there currently any way to uh, harvest the mist that is being sprayed off of uh, the with the mills pumping the water? Is there any way to save that water? So there's nothing really. I mean, there's no sort of major projects that I know of at the moment um, that are trying to kind of utilize it. Um, I mean, I know there has been progress in technology of extracting water from air. Um, and I mean, I have a classic example here of my air conditioner. I actually um, take the water and I mean, put it on my plants and I mean, you can even drink it. So um, taking water out of air is certainly something that is a possibility. Um, and it certainly could be. Um, the thing about the mist um, or the fog that rolls in over the West Coast, pretty much everything that lives there has adapted um, to having that fog available. Um, and so one would need to look very carefully at how much influence, you know, do you have if, um, if you start looking at, um, you know, harvesting it in some way. Um, I don't know of anything currently, but I'm sure that... Um, you know, it, it would definitely be a possibility. Thank you, Lorraine. Unfortunately, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us. Um, Nothing really, Rob, just to say thank you very much to everybody for listening. And um, yeah, a very happy new year um, to everyone. And I look forward to being able to share some webinars with you in 2024. So thank you very much. Lorraine, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, 
Give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.